Hello, Eric Olson. Um, what drew you to philosophy in the first place? Where did you come from, and what? How did you discover philosophy? Well, when I was growing up in the U.S., I didn't know what philosophy was. I'd never heard of philosophy really, or only as one of those abstruse university subjects, you know, that you hear about. Uh, and I mean, what I did know, I guess, was science because there were TV programs on science. You know, all of those Nova programs and whatever else, and that was really good fun when I was growing up. And I, 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 I enjoyed my, enjoyed my science classes in school. So that was what I wanted to be uh, throughout my adolescence and my youth. I wanted to be a scientist of some sort. Uh, the only question was what sort. Was it going to be biology or chemistry or something, something like that? Uh, and so I went off to university. Uh, way back in about 1981 or so. And this was Reed, uh, right? I went to Reed College in Oregon, yes. That was just uh, a mere six hours away <laughs> in the next state. Uh, and I signed up for lots of classes in chemistry and, 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 and mathematics and, uh, and so on, with, and, and a few other things. One of the courses I was, that every, every freshman at Reed was required to take was a humanities course. Uh, one of the one of the many unique and special features of Reed College, and on the syllabus in the autumn semester, the very first semester, uh, it started out with Homer. It was about the ancient Greeks, you know. So it starts, it starts out with Homer, and then you you, you, you you read all those Greek tragedies, you know, Aeschylus and uh, and Oedipus and, so, uh, and, and 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 Sophocles and so on, <laughs> uh, and Thucydides and Herodotus, and then it, and then it was Plato. And, and, and that was my first exposure to philosophy, actually, to real philosophy, anyway. And the text that we began reading was the Apology, where Socrates talks about uh, 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 why he was going to, uh, what is it about? It's, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's his defense at the trial when he was charged with corrupting the youth of Athens and so on. And it was sort of all about politics and and, and, and morality and so on, and I found it a bit dull, actually. But in the same volume, in the same little volume of Plato, there was a book called The Phaedo, which was about the arguments for the immortality of the soul. And I Very dodgy arguments. What's that? Very dodgy arguments. Well, like, well, well yes, exactly. Very dodgy arguments. And that's how I, saw, I, I found it. At, I, I saw it at the time, actually. But the, 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 the mere fact that you could give rational arguments for, or for that matter, against the immortality of the soul or whatever, uh, was really fascinating. And I thought, I, 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 I was really gripped by that. That seemed to me uh, so much more interesting than any of the other stuff, certainly more interesting than, than, than the chemistry and the, and, and the calculus and so on that I was trying to learn in my other classes. Uh, so that was, that was the beginning, I suppose. Uh, a little bit later, we read The Republic, uh, and again, uh, 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 the, it, it was the doctrine of the forms that I found really fascinating. And again, I, 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 I was convinced that it was dead wrong, <laughs> uh, uh, that Plato was a bit foolish, and it, it was this wild metaphysical theory, and it couldn't possibly be right. And I thought I could show beyond any reasonable controversy that, that, that it couldn't possibly be right. And I'm sure... Uh, my attempts, I mean, I haven't actually gone back and read the essays, but I'm sure my attempts were, 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 were no better than those that, that those of freshmen typically are. Uh, but I was really interested, actually. I was much more interested in that than, than I had been in any of my other university subjects. So you were a youth that was corrupted by Socrates? I suppose so, yes. I, I never thought of it that way, but <laughs> in a way, uh, yes. So was it essentially then that you realized you were going to go into philosophy? I mean, did you have to make a phone call to your parents and say and apologize for the money they were spending? Or uh, Not right away. That sort of started a, a, a process of thinking and soul searching. And, 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 and I mean, I, mean I'm, I don't make decisions rapidly, particularly important decisions. I tend to mull, mull them over and take as long as I possibly can. And it was the same in this case. I really, I really wasn't sure. It, 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 this sort of uh, threw all of my life plans into into doubt. But I wasn't quite ready to to, to, to plunge into something else. But at, at some point, I think in the course of the spring semester, 
I did more or less decide that this, this wasn't what I wanted to do, and I did have to, 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 to break it to my parents, <laughs> uh, who took it very well, I have to say. They were supportive. I mean, they weren't thrilled. <laughs> well, if they sent you to read in the first place, they've got to know that, uh, you know, this is a, it's a, it has a reputation as being a bit hippie. Yes. No it, grades, um, right? What's that? I, there are no grades, isn't that right? That's not true, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't even think it ever was true. What 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 was true with them, which is, as far as I know, it's, it's still true now, is that they don't actually give you your grades unless you ask for them. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> we're, we're grading you, but uh, we're not going to tell you what it is. Have to write them down. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to give a transcript. I suppose afterwards, not very easily. It's true. So. Yeah. After that point, presumably, given that you wanted to uh, refute everything that Plato said, he wasn't your earliest inspiration. Who was your earliest inspiration? Inspiration in the sense of a, a, a philosopher actually agreed with. Yes, yeah, someone you said, oh, that, that person, you know, really has grasped something important. I'm not sure, actually. I, I mean, I like debating with Plato, but as you say, I didn't really agree with him. Uh, one of the, I think the one of the philosophers that, we, that I had to read in the spring semester of the same course that, uh, that was required of all freshmen was Hobbes, actually Hobbes Leviathan, uh, and he was arguing for a very conservative view in, 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 in political philosophy, and I wasn't conservatively minded at that time, but I but, but I can see the force of his arguments actually, and I can remember in in in, in some of our discussions with with, with fellow students defending Hobbes, again, because, you know, freshmen are never conservative, in, in my experience. Anyway. So, 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 certainly not really. It was very unfashionable right. to be conservative. Uh, but I was defending Hobbes. I found myself, much to my surprise, actually, defending uh, Hobbes, to some extent anyway, against the objections of my classmates. Not that I was convinced by, by Hobbes' position, but I could see the merit in it anyway. Well, and uh, given the events of the past week of Brexit, you know, Hobbes is looking good. Yeah, uh, yes, well, <laughs> yes, yes, conservatism has gone out the window. Certainly those who call themselves conservatives with a capital C are just right. Really, That's yeah. uh, pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, you uh, you read The Republic and then uh, Leviathan in short order, two of the classics of political philosophy that nobody actually believes. Mm. Yes. Fortunately, perhaps. Yes, well, it's yes. It's I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what works in political philosophy. People do believe <laughs> that's true. Uh, uh, was Rawls for a while, but I don't know what it is anymore. Yes, I've never really studied Rawls. I mean, I mean, I suppose I suppose Locke is a bit more popular, but I didn't actually read Locke's political philosophy until much later. And I've you know I've never been all that interested in political philosophy. Actually, it's it's, it's just for some reason you never know, gripped me in the way that metaphysics does. Yeah. So metaphysics. Um, was it because of the Fido that uh, you were drawn to personal identity, or was it uh, a later class that um, convinced you that personal identity was uh, the topic you wanted to pursue? No, that was much, much later, actually. When I, that, that this was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get thinking about personal identity really until I was doing a PhD at Syracuse. And in fact, it was quite late in my PhD. In my PhD, I had done most of my courses, so it was probably three years or so into my PhD, actually. And then Peter Van Wagen, who I was a big fan of at that point, gave a seminar on personal identity, uh, and the main text of which was Peter Unger's book, which was quite recent at that time. Uh, what's it called? Identity, Consciousness, and Value. I think it is. You know that very thick white book, and that seemed to me all wrong, <laughs> actually. I mean, it was all about comparing various uh, 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 um, sort of variations of the psychological continuity view of personal identity, and testing them uh, against our intuitions in various very elaborate puzzle cases, so science fiction stories, basically. The fun stuff. Uh, uh, that sort of thing, yes. Yeah. So it, 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 it was about whether... Uh, personal identity through time consists just in continuity of mental content, so whether it, it, your, your, your basic mental capacities had to be preserved, that was the, that's what Unger thought, or something like that, whether there had to be some sort of physical constraint or, or whatever. 
Can uh, we use a transporter? That sort of thing. Yes, yes. And at, 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 at some point it became clear to me that every one of the views that Unger was considering had the implication, which Unger never actually mentioned, uh, that we're not biological organisms. Because no animal, no biological organism uh, persists by virtue of any sort of psychological continuity of any sort. Okay, so uh, the person has to be one thing and the animal has to be something else. Uh, and that seemed to me very, very strange. I mean, it seemed that, that the animal ought to be able to think and to be conscious and so on. And since I'm the, I think and, and, and I'm conscious, I should be an animal. That I'm an animal had struck me as uh, 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 a fairly obvious starting point in the debates. And here was an entire book devoted uh, 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 to discussing the, the various merits of views, every one of which was incompatible with that. With that, with that assumption. It's funny. Um, uh, the locus classicae of uh, the modern debate is is usually taken to be Locke, of course. Yeah. And um, very early on, he uh, distinguishes between man mm. and person. Yes. Um, he says it is not the idea of a thinking or rational being alone that makes the idea of a man in most people's sense, but of a body, so and so shape joined to it. And if that be the idea of the man, the same successive body not shifted all at once must, as well as the same immaterial spirit, go to the making of the same man. No. Uh, this premise to find wherein pers personal identity consists, we must consider what person stands for. So, of course, uh, he decides that the man is an animal and person is something else. It's, you know, his famous definition of... Um, uh, a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and consider itself as itself in different times and places. So it seems like most Lockeans, and I would count, you know, Derek Parfit in that school and presumably Unger, uh, are focused on the person. And you come along and say, hey, we've forgotten about the man. And I think the man is who we are. Whereas Locke wants to say, I'm easy. You can talk about the man, you can talk about the person. I'm not going to say either one of them is really me. It just depends on what circumstance you're interested in. Well, those bits of Locke that you quoted don't actually imply that the man, or as Locke says, or the organism is one thing and the person is something else. Uh, all they imply is that what it is to be a man or a, a, a human being or a human organism is different from what it is to be a person. Okay, and I don't dispute that. I don't think anyone disputes that. I mean, I don't think the claim that uh, angels or gods would be would be people, uh, but not human beings, is incoherent. That that, that's, that, that claim it may be false, and there may be no reason to believe it, but it's not uh, contradictory. So I accept that what it is to be a person is one thing, and what it is to be a human organism is something else. But I still, but, but I, I still think that it's the same thing that satisfies both. Uh, both both kinds, okay. And but Locke does elsewhere say things that imply, which he actually acknowledges, that the person is not the same thing as the man or the human being, and that they could come apart. Right. And the person could swap, could change from one, could 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 move from one human being to another human being. Right. The uh, prince uh, and the cobbler, the first science fiction yes. example. Uh, I don't know whether it's the first, but uh, yeah. uh, 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 yes. And also, uh, is a man drunk the same as a man sober? Um, See, yes, all that wild stuff, that seems to have set the tone for... Right. Uh, uh, it, all, it all went downhill from there, according to you. Well, it's still... That's, that's still the tone of so much discussion of, 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 of and, and personal identity. It's so much about wild stories and what we think... Of, who would be who in these wild stories? And that might be good fun, but it seems to ignore a lot of important metaphysical questions, such as whether you're an organism. And if you're not an organism, what are you? Now, um, some philosophers really like to get into sort of the history of their debate. So to sort of say... Um, well, I'm advancing this view, and actually, you know, one of the pre-Socratics had this view, and I'm just rediscovering it and embellishing it. Um, do you do that? I mean, have you gone back, and since you became sort of an acknowledged figure in the, in the debate, do you feel like you should go back and 
say, well, here's my version of the history of it, and here's a forgotten figure and this kind of thing? Or are you more sort of of your time and you say, I'm not re I don't really care about the history. I'm, I'm more talking about, you know, contemporary figures like Parfit or something like that. I haven't gone back and looked at the history of the subject really very much in the way that, say, Ray Martin has done. Uh, although it's not because I don't think, I think there's, not because I think there's, there's nothing we can learn from, from that debate. I think it's more beca because so much of the debate, particularly the debate on, 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 on the nature of people and personal identity, uh, is very foreign to the contemporary view, and it's 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 mostly based on the assumption that a person or a thinking conscious being could not be a material thing. You don't find the view that that, that uh, a material thing could think or be conscious in Locke or in Hume or in Kant even. Uh, uh, or in Reed, or in 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 in, uh, in, in Butler, or, or any of those uh, figures that figure in anthologies of historical sources. Uh, so they're all working on the assumption that uh, that a thinking conscious being has to be some sort of immaterial substance of the sort that that Descartes and Plato believe in. That's how it seems to me, anyway. Or at, at least it's it's. Either that, or else there's no thinking subject, which seems to be what Hume thought. Yeah, I, and 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 that seems to me all completely wrong-headed. And, and, and not, and, and I, I, I mean, the idea that uh, 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 a thinking conscious being might be a physical object didn't really get taken seriously until the 1950s or 60s. Yeah, I, I sort of have taken Locke to be agnostic. I. I I take him to say, well, I'm not sure if there is such a thing as mine, but, you know, I'm not going to make a big fuss about it. It doesn't really enter into it right now. Um, so, I, well, when I uh, originally read it, I always thought, yes, he's just followed, because you, you do Descartes and then you do Locke, and you say, well, you know, Descartes makes this distinction and Locke talks about material and immaterial. Let's just assume that Locke believes that there are two substances. But when I read Locke again, I it seems to me he doesn't really commit. And he says, you know, I'm not going to say if, if there is immaterial stuff. But uh, so I think you could have a Lockean view or an interpretation of Locke where he's more um, amenable to what you're saying. That's true, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, yes, you're right. Locke was, I think, trying to be agnostic about that. That's what I can remember Jonathan Bennett telling me when I was taking his seminars on, on, on early modern philosophy at Syracuse. Uh, but he doesn't, well, he doesn't really go into the uh, the metaphysics of thinking beings. He's not very interested in that, I don't think. Actually, I mean, it's 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 quite it's rather doubtful whether he's even doing metaphysics in that chapter. Actually, at least when he's talking about yeah, it starts from oh, it, the previous chapter is about mathematical concepts, and he's talking about identity. So it sounds like he basically starts off thinking about the equals sign. Okay, yes. Yes, yes. So it, I find Locke actually quite exasperating uh, because he's got the view that the person is, 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 is not, the, not the man, not the organism. He also seems to think that the person is not the immaterial thinker, if there is one. Okay. Uh, but he says nothing about what the person is. And he doesn't even seem to be interested in that question. Uh, he doesn't even give any hint of what, uh, of, 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 of any sort of positive view about the metaphysical nature of a person or a thinking being. And I find that really frustrating. So I, 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 I don't find it very, very, very useful philosophically to go back and look at the details of what Locke says. Yeah, now, so when you were rebelling against the Peter Unger book, when you mm. were reading it, what was your major sticking point? Because I find, actually, um, one of the things, uh, I was reading your um, piece in this, the sort of summary of the, the defense of animalism, and you write, uh, you, you come across a little bit like, 
there, well, there are certain figures throughout uh, uh, the history of philosophy who stand up for common sense. You know, like Reed, for example, is is famously defender of common yes. sense. Uh, and, you know, um, someone like Bernard Williams, more, more contemporarily. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of say, well, you know, the philosophers have, you know, got all tangled up and uh, clear, you, you know, this is silly. You point to it, isn't this silly? But I find when, um, when I introduce this, when I do the little, you know, imagine if you could uh, suck out the information in one brain and swap it with the other, you know, sort of content versions of the Prince of the Cobbler, except there's, you know, mad scientist doing it. You know, you just put little headbands on top of people, strap them down together and, and you know, then they start talking like uh, the other one used to. Uh, I find that students instantly and overwhelmingly are perfectly in tune with the idea that that's, you know, Joe was in that body, but now Joe is in this body. Mm. So they go with, with the personality. So it seems to me that it's a very common intuition. So what was it in you that rebelled against it? Uh, what, what stuck in your craw? Because I think it seems to me a little disingenuous to say, you know, oh, it's only because people are polluted by philosophy that they will have this intuition. And, you know, if we, we just stand by common sense, when it, I've always found that most people seem to go easily with the, with the lock. It seems like you want to say, well, they're being fooled in some way. They're, they're being, their intuitions are, are being tweaked. And if you, ask, uh, if you ask the question in the right way, they wouldn't fall for it. No, I wouldn't say that, actually. I'm, I'm, I don't think, that, I mean, I, I've had the same experience that uh, when you tell the, uh, if you, if, if you expl tell the story of the figures in the thought experiment, whether it's the brain transplant or the brain state transfer or the Star Trek teleportation or whatever, whatever it might be, then people usually go the Lockean way. They usually say that the, 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 the person who ends up Thinking and talking and acting and thinking like the original, like like the like the original person is the original person, and they ignore everything else. That's true. Like they, they don't learn that uh, from dodgy philosophy teachers. Uh, uh, though actually, they, figures that uh, yeah, yeah, yes. The, right. Actually, when I teach uh, adults. They're, they're much more skeptical, actually. In fact, they're very skeptical about these science fiction uh, thought experiments in the first place. So in, in, in a way, it's, 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 more it's, it's more difficult, in a way, to teach the material to adults because uh, I can't predict their reactions in the same way that I can with undergraduates. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, it's, so, so anyway, it's not that I think this, this widespread reaction is the result of, 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 of their being corrupted or deadly taught. It's just that it's only part of the story. I mean, it's, it's, it's natural to think that way uh, because we tend to think sort of in narrative terms and, you know, it's impossible to watch Star Trek without thinking that the man who materializes on board Starship Enterprise is the captain himself and, you know, uh, because, the, I mean, that's how the story's told. <laughs> uh, I think... The reason I distrust these thoughts is because when I think about the metaphysical implications, I find that I can't, I, I can't believe them. They seem to have, that they have, uh, when you think about what would follow metaphysically from this assumption, you end up with something even worse, it seems to me. And of course, when you ask, if you start by asking your students, uh, do you think you're a human being, a biological organism, of course, algorithm, of course they, they say yes. Uh, and if you tell them that first, and then you tell them the, uh, give them the Lockean argument, and point out that the Lockean argument has the implication that we're not biological organisms, they react quite differently, actually. Then they, 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 they're much more hesitant to accept the consequence. Yeah, so that actually leads kind of nicely into, um, uh, well, I'm going to ask you to summarize uh, what you would say, and this is going to require oversimplifying, of course, what we would say is the central argument of your first book, which was something of a, you know, bombshell at the time it came out. 
Let me see if I can remember how it went. Uh, um, I'm asking I, you to sing your greatest hits. Yes, yes. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, a bit out of practice, actually. Um, I, I, I think it was like this. Okay. Uh, I argued. Okay. So, so nearly everyone, uh, if I can remember how, how it begins, how, how does it, how, <laughs> Uh, the first verse, right? Um, 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 nearly everyone discussing personal identity uh, 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 endorses some sort of psychological continuity view of the sort that we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, this view, however, implies that we are not biological organisms. Okay. You don't move a biological organism from one head to another by transplanting its brain, right? Or by uh, 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 transferring its mental contents uh, through wires or, or, or anything like that. Okay. Uh, so if any sort of psychological continuity view is true, you and that animal could come apart. Okay. But of course the thing can't come apart from itself, so you must be something other than the animal. That seems to me to be a very problematic uh, view because it seems to be possible for an animal, biological organism, to have mental properties, to be conscious, uh, to have beliefs, uh, preferences, and so on. Uh, if any biological organism can have any mental property, then a human, a human being uh, uh, would have mental properties and would be thinking and, and, and intelligent and so on. Uh, so the psychological continuity view would have the implication that I'm one of two thinking conscious beings sitting here and thinking these thoughts. So there's, there's the thinking animal and there's the thinking person. Uh, that looks like an absurd thing to say. I mean, how could I never know which of these two beings I was? How could I ever know that I was the one that would go with its transplanted brain rather than the one that would stay behind with an empty head? Uh, so uh, if I'm right in thinking that there are human animals, and that human animals have mental properties. It follows, seems to follow anyway, that we're animals. And that means that personal identity through time is animal identity through time. So you go where the animal goes, contrary to 300 years of uh, philosophical thinking about personal identity. Okay, That's, so uh, now you criticized Locke uh, for not giving an account of what persons are. Mm -hmm. Suppose a Lockean were to push back a little and say, okay, uh, but what we the Lockeans do is give incredibly detailed and, you know, much wrangled over uh, descriptions of the uh, continuation conditions of a person. Yeah. You don't do that for an animal. You seem to be resting on common sense intuitions about what it is for an animal to continue through time or what even an animal is. Suppose I were to say animals strikes me as a very dubious concept. Of course, it's one that we throw around all the time and one that we use all the time. But, you know, philosophers are forever taking aim at, concept, at common sense concepts and saying, well, really when you push them, there's nothing there, or it leads to inconsistencies. Do you think uh, you owe an account of the continuation conditions of an animal uh, right up, up front, or do you think that we can we we have enough of an idea of what it is for an animal to continue and and begin? Because I mean, I'm thinking, for example, in um, in bioethics, when uh, an animal begins is uh, an important topic to settle and when it ends like for example uh what's the ending point of me suppose i am an animal uh what's the ending point of me the animal yeah. is it uh when my heart stops beating is it when my brain goes down well but there are still plenty of living organisms in me i mean uh there's there's a philosophy of what it is to be alive that raises all kinds of puzzles. Mm. Well, okay, good. I, I think I've got, I've got a good argument for the claim that we are animals or biological organisms. And there is uh, a whole science uh, devoted to the study of biological organisms. It's biology. It may be that biology is really full of problems, but it's certainly a, a flourishing science anyway. Uh, 
Now, it's true that there are lots of metaphysical questions about, about animals, and I haven't got answers to those metaphysical, metaphysical questions uh, 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 any more than anybody else does. I might have opinions, but those, are in, those opinions about the metaphysics of animals are independent of my conviction that I'm an animal. Uh, I suppose these questions about the, the, the metaphysics of animals arise for anyone who thinks that we're animals. Uh, it's not as if you could avoid these uh, questions, or that these questions would not arise if you thought that we were not animals, uh, because they still arise about the animals that we're not on that view. Uh, so I don't think I've got, I, I don't think saying, saying that we're animals doesn't, doesn't raise additional problems that, that uh, you wouldn't get if you didn't hold that view. It does raise problems. I mean, maybe those questions about animal identity become more important or more interesting or more worrying if we were animals than it would be if we were not animals. Uh, but I don't think it makes those questions. It, 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 it doesn't create those problems. It doesn't make them any more difficult to solve. Now, uh, the, the central argument, as as you put it, and, and the one that uh, you return to in, in like, uh, you have that paper, Where, Was I a Fetus, um, yes. uh, that is in a sort of introductory book. So, so that's, that's your, your selling point. The, um, you, you make, you, you return to this issue of there can't be two things. There should, we shouldn't say that there are two things thinking here, mm -hmm. sitting in this chair, an animal that thinks and me that thinks, mm -hmm. uh, two thinkers is, is just unacceptable. Now, I think what most people, when they, when they disagree with this, the example that they would come up with, well, wait a minute, I'm a parent and I'm a teacher. Are there two thinkers because of that? Or do we have to say that only the parent does the thinking, whereas the teacher doesn't? What's your immediate response to that? The, the parent is the teacher. It's not as, it, the, 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 the being a parent is, is, is a different property from being a teacher, but it's the very same thing that has both properties. Otherwise, you would have a sort of substance dualism between parents and teachers, right? Something like, so, 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 so that what appeared to be one human being who uh, uh, teaches in the classroom by day and, and looks after her children by night, or his children, I should say, uh, uh, is really, is, is really uh, a combination, is, is really two beings, one who only teaches by day and doesn't parent by night, and one who parents by night but, but doesn't teach by day, and so on. And, and, and much the way that, 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 that Descartes was committed to saying that what looks to be uh, 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 one being that thinks and walks and talks and eats and so on is really two beings, one of which thinks but doesn't walk or talk, and one of which walks and talks but doesn't think. That looks like just... I mean, and, and, and what's more, there's no reason. There might be a reason to think that, uh, that, that it couldn't be the physical object that thinks, but there seems to be no reason to think that uh, something couldn't be both a teacher and a parent. So, but they certainly do have different subsistence conditions, uh, like, you know, becoming a, uh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, continuation conditions. Like, uh, uh, I was actually a teacher before I was a parent. Mm -hmm. And um, will continue to be a parent, I hope, until you know the day I die. Uh, whereas I hope that I won't continue to be a teacher until the day I die. Um, and uh, so, what you would say then is that this com It seems to me that the the important distinction between the the parent teacher confluence and the hu the human person confluence is that. Um, the human is the substance in some sense, because what, what you said is that there's no substance dualism between, uh, between, pers uh, between parent and teacher. They're just properties, as it were, of, of a more basic substance. Whereas you wanted to say that the animal is, in some kind of Aristotelian sense, a substance. Is that a misrepresentation? Um, going back to, 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 to what you said just a moment ago, you, you, well, I, I guess there are two things that you were saying. One, you started by saying that 
teachers and parents have different persistence conditions. Persistence, yes. Persistence, yes. Sorry, uh, I said substance. Persistence, yes. Uh, I don't think that's right. I don't think that if you stop being a teacher, a teacher ceases to exist. Uh, it's the very, uh, and likewise, when you become a parent, it's not as if some new thing comes into existence, which didn't exist before, the parent. Uh, there's nothing that could happen to you that would destroy the teacher without destroying the parent or vice versa. Uh, the teacher could not, the, you could cease to be a teacher, but a teacher would not cease to exist without the parent also ceasing to exist and the person and the, the interviewer and so on. So there are, well, if we counted the number of teachers in the world, when I cease to be a teacher, there is one fewer teachers, but there's not one fewer parents. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, but that does not mean that anything has ceased to exist. It's like we can count the number of people in the room. Okay, maybe it's five. Okay, but when Peter leaves, then the number is only four. Okay, then there's, there are only four people in the room. But that doesn't mean that anyone has ceased to exist. Uh, all right, let's try. Uh, let me see if I can uh, try a different approach. Um, do you believe in persons? Do you mean do I believe that persons or people exist? Yes. Of course I do, yes. Okay. You and I are both people. Right? Okay, so, but what you would say is that a person's existence, well, on what does a person's existence depend? If, uh, you know, you say, for example, it's perfectly possible that there could be angels uh, or other heavenly beings who are persons but are not humans. Mm -hmm. So on what does the existence of a person depend? Maybe it depends on what sort of person it is. I mean, for a human, uh, 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 for a human person to exist, there has to be a human organism. Uh, and maybe the organism has to be alive, biologically speaking, though that's controversial. For there to be an angelic person, there has to be an angel, whatever sort of being that is. I, I, I don't know. I think about the metaphysics of angels. Uh, uh, but it seems misleading to say that for a person, well, you could say that for a person to exist, there has to be a, a being with the right sort of special mental properties, the ones that are distinguished, that are, that are distinctive of people and the ones that, that non-people haven't got. Uh, but that, and it's true, it's true that, that nothing could be a person at a particular time without having those properties. I suppose that's right anyway. Uh, but it doesn't follow from that, that uh, a person stops existing if something stops having those properties. Because you might, you might stop being a person, but still exist. So you want to say that, like it seems to me, like Locke says, that um, I'm an animal and I'm a person. Why don't you have the two thinkers problem just as much as the Lockeans do? Because I think the person and the animal are one and not two. So there's only one thinker. Okay, so when I say when I say there's a person sitting in this chair and there's an animal sitting in this chair, yes. um, and a teacher and a parent, and so a... only one of those things is most basic, is the real thing. No, no, no. When you say those things, of course, there's only one thing there, which, okay. which, has, many, which has many properties. Now, it may be that one of those properties is metaphysically more basic. Uh, than the others. I'm not quite sure what that what that amounts to, but that may be true. Uh, and maybe uh, being an organism is metaphysically more basic than being a teacher. But don't you have to say that? Because otherwise, why can't I say, I'm something I know not what, here are some of its properties. It's an animal, it's a person, it's a teacher, it's a parent. You want to say, but wait a minute, the animal one is the most important one. Well, maybe it's more, it, it might be more important in the sense that you could not cease to be an animal but still exist. 
at least I, I, I don't think an animal could cease to be an animal and still exist anyway. Though th that, that's one of those questions about the metaphysics of organisms uh, that are independent, th 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 that are disputed and also independent of the view that, independent of whether you and I are organisms or non-organisms. Okay, uh, I'm convinced that we're organisms. Uh, I'm, I, I might still be uncertain about whether an organism could still exist without being an organism, though, well, I doubt it, but that, that's, that's an, 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 an independent claim. But uh, it's not that I think that one of those entities, namely the animals, more important than the other entities, the teacher, the parent, the person, and so on, there's only one entity there. Uh, maybe being an animal is the most, or being an organism is the more uh, metaphysically interesting or metaphysically important property. Does that make sense? I, I, I mean, you could stop being a teacher and still exist. You could stop being a parent and still exist. You could stop being a person and still exist, I suppose, if to be a person is, is to have certain special mental properties. Uh, I mean, you weren't always, or the animal wasn't always a person in that sense. So, uh, um, but there are other properties as well that maybe are also, that, that, that you couldn't lose, being a material thing, for example, being located in space. Uh, uh, maybe those are less interesting just because they're less specific. But I haven't got a sort of general theory uh, about which properties are most metaphysically basic. Have you, um, are you familiar with Fred Feldman's terminology, the termination thesis? Yes. Yeah, so he uh, talks about, I, I find his um, advertising deceptive because what he says is there are people who argue that when we cease to think or we cease to have the properties that a person must have, we cease to exist. I am not one of these. I am a survivalist, he says. Uh, and so, you know, this sounds like, oh, great. He believes that there is life after death. And he says, what it means to be a survivalist is that after we die, we continue to exist as corpses. And it's yes. like at that point, I think I've been sold a bill of goods. You know, mm -hmm. that's not the survival that I was looking for. Sure. Um, so now, and he makes hay out of... Uh, this discussion about Aunt Ethel. He says, you know, when Aunt Ethel dies, uh, something's left behind, you know, that hospitals or, or whomever have to dispose of hygienically. Um, when we point at this corpse, what do we say? What is it appropriate to say? He says, I think it's appropriate to say that's Aunt Ethel. Whereas, you know, the uh, espousers of the termination thesis have to say that is the remains of Aunt Ethel, or that is something that yeah. uh, is there to remind us of the now departed Aunt Ethel, or something uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. Is that the kind of intuition that you're going for? Because, I mean, I find it perfectly easy to say, uh, after I stop thinking, I, 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 I find the termination thesis more appealing. Uh -huh. So what would you say uh, is your biggest weapon against that intuition. Yes, well, of course, yes. What happens to an animal when it stops, when it dies, whether it carries on as a corpse or whether it ceases to exist, that, that's one of the questions about the metaphysics of, of organisms that are independent, again, that, that are independent of whether you, you and I are organisms or not. And, and again, it's, it's also a question that arises for anybody who believes in organisms, whether or not uh, they think that we are organisms. Uh, I don't agree with as it happens, I, I disagree with Feldman about this, and, and I think the main reason is that I can't, when I ask myself, what does it take for an organism to persist through time? What does it take for, uh, 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 what would it take to destroy uh, an animal, that is to uh, uh, cause it to cease to exist? I can't think of a very good answer that's compatible with uh, Feldman's view that an animal exists as a corpse after it dies. I'm also unconvinced by the, by, by the arguments that Feldman gives for this view, the view that he calls uh, survivalism. They, the, 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 the main argument seems to be that that's how we talk. We say, yes, the, uh, it's Aunt Ethel in the, in the coffin. Aunt Ethel was buried here. 
uh, and so on. It's true that we do say those things, but I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that these sayings reflect any, any deep and settled metaphysical conviction. I mean, because we can also say, I scattered Aunt Ethel after I cremated her. And at that point, he is, he's prob I, I'm pretty sure he would say, no, Aunt Ethel doesn't exist after, after you've cremated her. You might, yes. Here's something else. I mean, think about someone who believes in life after death, a real survivalist, you might say. So right. someone who thinks that Aunt Ethel is now in the next world, uh, in heaven. Okay, right. this person would, 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 would be just as, just as, just as, as inclined as the rest of us to say, to say that Aunt Ethel was buried here. Right, and, and this doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be inconsistent. Uh, so I don't think these ordinary sayings are uh, reflect any very deep metaphysical metaphysical view. So, but uh, what I was trying to get at is, um, what are we picking out when we say "me," or when I say "me"? What am I referring to? You say the most obvious uh, and almost trivially true thing you can say is that I'm picking out an animal. Uh, if I just deny that and say, I want to say, okay, uh, or, or let's say, you know, I get a brain bleed or something and my cortex dies, but I don't even need a, a respirator. Say my brain stem is working and it's keeping my lungs working. So, you know, you could take me off the respirator and unfortunately I continue to exist as has happened in famous cases. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say, I'm gone. You know, get rid of that thing. Don't waste any money uh, keeping that going because yeah. I'm gone. Um, would you say that's a mistake? Yes and no. It depends on what you mean by saying I'm gone. I would say you still exist. Uh, because the animal still exists, and when when you say me, you refer to the animal. It, it, it's the animal that that's asking the questions, okay? But when you say I'm gone, you might mean well, your life has no longer has any value. Uh, you're as good as it's it's just as it, it, it's for, for all practical purposes, it's just as if you no longer existed. There's no there's no point. It benefits no one to keep you alive, to continue feeding you, and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think I would agree that if this happened to me, there would be no point in keeping me alive, and I would not want to be kept alive in that condition. Certainly, wouldn't want people to spend any money keeping me alive, and so on. So, for all practical purposes, I'm gone, even though uh, actually I still exist. It's just that my, an existence in that condition has no more uh, value to me than existing as a corpse. If Feldman is right. So it sounds like what you think is. Um Ethical issues like abortion or euthanasia or things like that are not to be settled by metaphysics because you can't just say, oh, this is easy because he yeah. doesn't exist anymore. So do what you will with that chunk of flesh. Uh, what you would say is, no, no, I still exist and I am that chunk of flesh, but it just so happens that that chunk of flesh is of no value to anyone. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not the metaphysical issue that's going to settle things easily, it's going to be we have to have a question about value. We have to have a debate about what's valuable and what's important. I agree with that, yes. I, I don't think metaphysics by itself settles any ethical questions. We have to do moral thinking as well. I mean, the, the metaphysics might put certain constraints on our moral thinking. For example, if, our, if, if, if we were organisms, you can't say abortion is okay because... Uh, the thing in the womb is not a person or not something that could ever come to be a person. So the per the, you can't say that the person doesn't yet exist in the womb. That's a mistake, I think, if I'm right. Uh, but it doesn't, fo it doesn't follow from, the, fr fr from my claim that you existed as a, as a fetus, that uh, abortion is murder, for example. That's a further claim, a further ethical claim, and that needs moral argument. Um. It strikes me that you use person in two different ways sometimes. Uh, there was a quote from here that, uh, or, oh, no, I know. It was from this book, which is uh, a book uh, of interviews with various metaphysicians, and you are in here. Uh -huh. 
And there was one quote of yours that I wanted to highlight. Uh, yes, you said, this line of thought convinced me that psychology was completely irrelevant to personal identity. Mm -hmm. So, it seems to me that you want to say two things. Uh, we've established that you believe in persons. You say there are such things as persons. Well, you wouldn't say things, but there are persons. Sure, th such things as I'm happy to say. Right. But would you, do you think that those things, persons, psychology is irrelevant to those, or would you agree, oh, okay, I'll leave the identity conditions of persons to, I don't know, Lockeans, and what they say is basically okay, but where I deal with them is where I say what I am. I would say I am, in some most basic level, an animal rather than a person, although I will concede that I am also a person. Um, do you want to say then, because when you say my theory of personal identity is animalism, that doesn't seem quite right. It means your theory of what I am most basically is an animal. Whereas you could, so you could talk about, here's what I'm trying to say. When people talk about personal identity, perhaps you would want to say, it's a little bit unfortunate that we use that term because I don't think persons are what's most important or what's most basic. I think animals are. Um, but given that there is this term person, you say, okay, I believe there are persons too and here are their identity conditions or so on. I just don't think that that's me. Uh, so there are two senses of the word personal identity. There's personal identity as the field of what it, I am most basically, and then there's personal identity as, well, given that there are persons, as well as animals, but there are persons, here's what you should say about what it takes for a person to continue through time. Do you see what I'm saying? So the word personal identity, identity can mean lots of different things. So right. there's a question about what it takes for a person to persist through time. Uh, my answer to that question is that it's it's what it takes for a human animal to persist through time, since that's what that, that's what human people are. But well, uh, but you also conceded that there are no, that there could be non-human persons. Yes. So given that they have in common that they are persons, but they don't have in common that they are humans, there must be subsistence conditions for persons that are independent of humanity. So I keep saying subsistence, you know what I mean. Uh, okay, if there could be non-human people, then I would say that there are no persistence conditions for people as such. Okay, because what it would take for uh, an angelic person or a divine person or whatever, or a demon, you know, some sort of immaterial person to persist through time would be different from what it is for a human person to persist through time. So I think it's, it's just... So persistence conditions are tied to animals, at least in this field? Uh, if something is both a person and an animal, then you might say it gets its, pers its persistence conditions from its, from its nature as an animal rather than its nature as a person. But that's, uh, I see. What, that's what I would say. I, 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 um, 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 yes, I think actually most of my opponents who think that we're not animals would also say that if we were animals, then we would have animal persistence conditions. They seem to accept that. Okay, I get it. So, uh, for example, suppose if data from Star Trek, which is now, data, I guess, is now a dated reference because uh, most of my, I can't use him anymore because my students have not seen Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, he would have different persistence, even if we establish that he's a person, he would have different persistence conditions from you and me. His persistence conditions would be the persistence conditions for an android or whatever. Some sort of some sort of inorganic robot. Is that what he is? Oh yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yes. That's that's right. Yes, yes. So it's 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 very often assumed in, 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 in setting out the problem of personal identity over time that there is an answer to the question: What does it take for a person to persist from one time to another? Uh, it seems to me that very question is tendentious. So what you would say, a better way to put it is, what is it for a thing that is a person to continue to exist through time? That, that doesn't help, because the answer to that question might depend on what sort of person you're talking about. I would rather ask, what does it take for us to persist through time, or, or, or for human people, or whatever the relevant category is. So if 
you point at someone, this would be rude, and you would get ushered out of the hospital, but suppose you were to point at someone in a persistent vegetative state whose cortex has liquefied, as they discovered with Terry Schiavo when they did the, yes. uh, when they did the autopsy. You point at that uh, being and you would say, there's a person. Well, that would be a bit like pointing at that being and saying, uh, uh, there's a teacher or there's a parent. I don't think she was a parent, but, but never mind. It, it, it would be like right. saying, yeah, y y yes, this is, this is uh, I don't know, a football player or w w whatever it might be. Uh, it would be more accurate to say this is something that was once a person or a teacher or a parent or, or, or whatever. Okay, so what it is, could, would, would this be a misleading way of putting things? Suppose I say, okay, um, there are conditions uh, that establish what it takes to continue as a teacher or to continue as a person, and I'm going to call those the persistence conditions for teacherhood or the persistence conditions for personhood. You would say that's just misusing the terminology or just speaking metaphorically in some sense? I guess I would say what it takes for a teacher to persist uh, depends on what sort of thing a teacher is, what sort of thing, metaphysically speaking, a teacher is. So if it turns out that teachers are animals, because we are animals and teachers are all human people, then uh, uh, what it takes for a teacher to persist is what it takes for a human animal to persist. But if there could be teachers of different metaphysical kinds, like teach, teaching robots, say, or teaching angels or whatever, uh, their persistence conditions would be, I suppose, very different from ours. Yeah. Um, there was something you said earlier, actually, that, that, that I didn't agree with. You, okay, you, okay. I think you, you were, I don't mean to interrupt your... your, your no, thing, no, no, please do. You, you ascribed to me the view that we are more fundamentally animals and less fundamentally people, teachers, parents, and so on. I don't think I want to agree. I mean, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound right. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm less of a parent than I am an animal or that my relation to the property of being a parent is looser than my relation to the property of being an animal. I would say but you that, could lose your teacherhood, but you couldn't lose your animalhood. That's true. That's true. But I still have those two properties in the same sense. I, I, I really am a person. I really am a teacher. I really am a parent, and so on. But one of them you couldn't lose without ceasing to exist. That's true. Uh, uh, I have one of the properties essentially, and the other ones only accidentally. But then, but that's not in itself as interesting as it might sound. I mean, there are plenty of properties that I have essentially that have no interest whatsoever, such as not being a prime number. So uh, 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 that's a property that I have and could not possibly lose. Okay, but it's, 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 it's it, you know, it's not one that, that my biographers will bother to mention. <laughs> you never know. That would, yes, that would be a surreal biographer. Mm. Okay, um... Let's move on to your second book so far, which is What Are We? with this yeah. nice Egon Schiele cover. Right. I don't know if nice is ever the right adjective for Egon right. Schiele, but um, w uh, would you say that uh, you, your view had changed between the human animal and what are we? Or would you just say that after the human animal you were attacked from various fronts and you felt the need to respond on all fronts but your view is basically the same uh so would you say that your view has changed or just your statement of the view has become more refined or something uh well i suppose there are some things that i said in the human animal that i'm not very sure about now uh but i didn't write what are we, because I changed my mind about anything, nor did I write it as a response to my critics, really. It was more uh, because I wanted to discuss uh, the more general question. The, 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 the human animal was mostly about, about uh, 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 
It was mainly an attack on psychological account, psychological continuity accounts of personal identity. Okay, whereas uh, and, 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 and arguing in favour of our being animals. And I wanted to discuss the more general question of what are we, uh, what are the alternatives to our being animals? What are the possible views? What, what sort of thing might we be? And that's what, what are we was about. So it starts with the view that we're animals, it discusses the pros and cons of that, and then discusses what I took to be the main alternatives uh, to that view. That's my phone going off over there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. That's usually well right. Unless it keeps going. Now it's stopped, okay. Okay. Um, so what were the new alternatives uh, that cropped up that you discussed in What Are We? I'm not sure whether they were new. Uh, I discussed the view, the, the view that we are, uh, uh, material, we are non-animals constituted by animals. That means that you're a material thing, you're the same size as the animal, you are actually visible and tangible and so on. You're physically indistinguishable from the, from the animal, but you and the but you're still something di something different from the animal. Right? So, so so the same matter can make up more than one material thing at the same time. That's, it, that that was one one view. Isn't that a, isn't that basically saying because you're perfectly open to the idea that the same matter can make up more than one thing? Uh, if we use the term thing loosely, because it can be the same matter can be a teacher and a parent and so on. So there's a teacher, there's a parent. Um, well, uh, whereas well, it seems it, like it, it can the only different a thing that's a, that's a more than one kind. And I, I, I'm, I'm not happy with saying uh, that even loosely that I'm that there's more than one thing sitting here. Namely, there's a, a person and a philosopher and a metaphysician and a teacher and a parent and so on. That seems that sounds. That's the intuition you will not back down on, the, the, the very much basis of the there can't be two things sitting in this chair. Well, one of there could be is a, a, a deep metaphysical question, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't think, I'm not happy with saying just uh, sort of casually as if it were uncontroversial that there are two things here, namely a person and a, and a philosopher. So what's a thing then? A thing is just a mac. It's just a completely general account now. There's no. I, I haven't got a theory about things. The, the thing is not an interesting kind. Um, this as well. But you can say, uh, is there a teacher sitting there? And you would say yes. And is there a parent sitting there? And you would say yes. Yes. Okay. So we're well, not counting uh, things when we do that. But, 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 but the move I would resist is saying that because there's a teacher there and there's a parent there, there are therefore two things there. That's double counting. Whereas uh, the view that you've just described, uh, that's Lynn Rudder Baker, for example, for example yes. thinks that. Um, you would say that they are saying there are two things there? Yes. Well, uh, actually, Baker wants to resist that, though it's, uh, it's not clear to me why she wants to resist that, and, and I don't fully understand her view. I'm not sure whether anyone does, actually. But uh, certainly people, uh, 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 many philosophers such as uh, Shoemaker, uh, 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 Dupke, uh, Mark Johnston, uh, 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 do want to say, and say, and say very clear, clearly that there are two things there. Baker concedes that the person and the animal are numerically different, uh, although she wants to say that in some sense they're only one thing. Um, couldn't you have a view sort of like yours, except to say, uh, my view is is just like Eric Olson's, except I I say the person is the one I am essentially, and the animal is not what I am. Uh, my animal property is contingent, and my person property is essential. So it sounds like you're saying that I am an animal and I'm a person, but I could stop being an animal and still exist, whereas I could not stop being a person and still exist. Right. Is that right? Yeah. So, and, and to be a person is to is to be intelligent and self-conscious and to have certain special mental properties. So, in the in the Terry Schiavo case that you described, where you uh, where a person uh, loses those special mental properties, but her biological functions carry on. So, you know, breathing, uh, 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 circulation, digestion, all of that stuff carries on without. Right. Any without any artificial life support and so on. In, that, in those cases, the person ceases to exist. 
Right. Life does not stop, but personhood does. Now, that seems like something different. I'm happy to say that you stop being a person. That is, you lose the property of personhood when that happens, but you carry on existing as an animal. And, you even, and I would say, therefore, if you carry, uh, you carry on existing as a living animal. Yes. You know, yes. Because yes. you are that, respiring. That's not a view according to which being a person is essential to you. Because you oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I, I, when I said you carry on existing, I, I misspoke. I mean, something carries on existing as a living animal, but you don't. You cease to exist. Well, that seems to imply that the living animal is something different from me, because the, the, the animal has, has, has carried on existing. I've ceased to exist. If I were the same thing as the animal, it would follow that I'd outlived myself. <laughs> Which I take to be involved. Something outlived me. So yeah. I, I guess that view would have to say that life is not a property of persons. It's a property of animals. So that seems to imply that a person is not a living thing. Yeah, and I think uh, I think actually that comes up in discussions of God. It's not clear whether or not God is alive. Oh, it's I, I, it's it's it, uh, it, I'm sure that. Uh, those who that the theistic God, if there is one, would, is, is not a biological organism. Or, or alive, not even alive. Is 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 sorry, yes, it's not alive in the biological sense. Yes, yes, yes that's that's right. Uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't follow from that that human people are not alive in the biological sense. But if they if, if they are not alive in the biological sense, then they certainly certainly are not organisms, and probably are not material things at all. Right. I mean, I would have to say that. Uh, it, or, I mean, couldn't you say, well, they are material things as long as they're housed in bodies. But, you know, when they are downloaded into the matrix after the, you know, to preserve them for when they can give them robot bodies later on, mm -hmm. uh, then they are persons, but they're no longer humans. Yes. OK. Uh whether that's compatible with your being an animal depends on depends on whether it's possible to uh, download a biological organism into the matrix. Well, you're no longer a per you're no longer an animal at that point, but you're still a person. But does the animal st or the thing that was an animal still exist? I mean, yes, I it just doesn't think anymore. But you so so could, could could you do it with some other with a dog, let's say, or with a with a rose bush? Could you download that into the matrix? No, because what you're downloading. Well, only if it's conscious, which I hope rose bushes aren't, because then I would feel terrible. But, um, you know, because what you're downloading is the consciousness. Maybe I'm not sure how this downloading works, but I, I suppose it works by extracting the information from my brain and putting it into the computer, in, into, sorry, the matrix, whatever, whatever right, that right. is. Uh, it seems to me that the organism might well still exist. And it, it, I mean, it, it might no longer function cognitively but it might be in a sort of vegetative state like Terry Shiver. So it looks like you haven't moved the animal. Right. Up, uh, no, I agree. Into the matrix or whatever. No, you so haven't. It follows that if you, if you, if you could move, put me into the matrix, then I would, that I'm not an animal. Right. But nothing that was ever an animal could be in the matrix. Uh, no, something that was an animal is now in the matrix. So, but, but there's also something that was an animal that is still an animal and is, and, and, and is never in the matrix, but simply is a sort of human vegetable. Right. I mean, but if you could uh, twin me, uh, no, if you could, you know, cut me down the middle in, in my, like, Parfit's my division cases where he takes out heart, hemispheres of brains. I know you don't like these cases, but in theory, this might be possible where, you know, they, you take the two hemispheres and you put one, the, the triplets, you know. Uh, two of them, their brains get destroyed. One of them, his body gets destroyed. So you take half of the hemisphere uh, from the one whose body is destroyed and you put each of it in the intact uh, bodies of the uh, other two triplets. Yeah. And then they go off in two directions. And you could say, now, I guess, no, you're not, uh, you're, uh, of course, 
uh, I'm misspeaking because there were three animals and there's still three it, animals it there. In all those cases, the, the animal that I say that you are stays behind. Nothing, oh. everything happens to it. Okay, so a, a you, better case is, is yeah, my division. So, so it, it follows from that view that you are not the animal. Okay, no. then um, a single, think of uh, what happens with identical twins. Uh, you get a fertilized egg, uh, yeah. and it is, uh, to all intents and purposes, one organism. And then, for whatever reason, it splits. This is one of the the things that uh, Catholic theologians worry over, because uh, it seems to show that we don't begin at conception. They, uh, some theologians would say, okay, we must begin after the point at which twinning is possible, because otherwise you get these, these problems. But it seems like there's one organism, and then there's two organisms. And you could say, couldn't you say, um, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, I, I want to say that that's a little bit like um, the uh, what happens to me when I get downloaded. I get downloaded the, the organism that was overlapping with me as it were or that you could say I was that organism in all material senses because that was the that was the material realization of me um, that continues to exist but I continue to exist most basically as the information in the computer or something I suppose what happens in the in the twinning case, it's, it's the same thing as what happens when an amoeba divides in two. Right. Uh, you start out with one organism and you end up with two organisms, and the, the biologists usually, usually, usually say that these are two new organisms. This is a case of reproduction rather than a case of growth or split. Of yeah, I, I know, for example, Feldman says that uh, the original, this is one of his arguments uh, that show that defining death is very difficult because uh, mm. the original amoeba has exited from life without dying because it is there is no it no longer exists but it's wrong to say that it dies so death is not merely exit from life because you can have deathless yeah, yeah, yeah but you, your suggestion seems to be that there are two things here which are physically indistinguishable okay if I were uh, as you put it downloaded into the matrix <laughs> one of them would become a human vegetable the other one would end up in the in the computer. Yeah, you would never you would never have the two uh, thinkers issue though, because the one that's in the computer was always doing the thing. Now I guess you do have the problem because then you would have to say, well, the animal did. Uh, I guess my I would have to say whether or not the vegetable just sprung into existence at the moment I exited it. In which case, where was it before? Or um, I say that it was never, never, it was never intelligent to begin with. Right. That would be a sort of dualism, I suppose. Which suppose. doesn't, which I wouldn't want to say. Uh, otherwise, you've got two thinkers, and you, you, you also need, need to say something about how it is that one of these two apparently indistinguishable objects has the power, uh, uh, has the power to move to the computer, whereas the other one would merely. Uh, 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 hasn't got that ability, but w w would merely lose its 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 its, its mental powers if its brain contents were 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 erased. I mean, what is it about the one that's what is it about one of these two objects that enables it to move to the computer, uh, whereas the other one when, when the other one doesn't? Right. So, what's the uh, what's the obvious difference? I'm, I'm presuming this is an easy. A case for you to rebut. Suppose I were to draw the analogy of chair of philosophy. For my sins, I am currently the chair of a very tiny philosophy department. But no sympathy. <laughs> I won't be forever, dear God. I will not be forever. Uh, but I will continue to exist. The chair of philosophy will no longer be me. The chair chair will exist, and I will exist. At the moment, they coincide, yeah. but soon they will split, and neither one of them will cease to exist. Um. Well, if you think that, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that some one thing, that there is this thing, the chair of, 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 of the department, uh, which is 
now male and next year it might well be female, let's say, and which will move discontinuously uh, from one body to another when the torch is passed or what, you know, when the initi initiation ceremony takes place or whatever, whatever it is. When the button uh, stops. Uh, that sounds like an extravagant metaphysical claim. And that too would imply, would seem to imply anyway, that, that, that there are two thinking beings there, the, the, the man and the chairman. Whereas you say there's just one. So what, so the, what you would, would you deny then that there is one chair of philosophy that continues throughout the ages? Yes, I would deny that. So you just say there's a lot of chairs of philosophy. Yes, yes. A number of people sequentially uh, have the property or, 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 or the role of being chair. So when we talk of the chair of philosophy uh, has existed since, you know, the founding of the university or something, you would say, well, not really. You might mean the institution or the role has existed, but certainly not, not the, but, 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 but there is no one concrete being uh, which has always held that role and which has changed sex and, and, and changed age and so on and, 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 and jumped discontinuously <laughs> Uh, uh, at, at regular intervals, or at least I, I wouldn't accept that without some metaphysical argument anyway. There are, meta, there are metaphysical views that have that implication, uh, but I wouldn't accept it just uh, 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 without becoming convinced of one of, those, one of those views, one of those general metaphysical views. Okay. Now, uh, another view that you tackle in here is a view uh, that... For example, David Lewis. David Lewis uh, famously contributed this to the personal identity debate. Um, this suggestion, he, he didn't come up with the, uh, the metaphysical theory, but certainly he did a lot to argue for it, um, which is sometimes called four-dimensionalism, yes. but which is this idea. Uh, so, for example... What Lewis pointed out is that it helps to solve puzzles, some puzzles. Famously, there's a puzzle in personal identity of uh, if I did divide, like yes. with Parfit. This, this is where Parfit's case of the triplets might yes. come in handy, where, um, you know, again, three triplets get into a horrible accident. Uh, two of them lose their brains. One of them loses everything but their brains. So... We cut, uh, and we're assuming that the hemispheres, which is questionable, but uh, we, let's assume that the hemispheres are duplicates of each other's, and we, we take them and we put them, put one hemisphere in one intact body and the other in the other intact body. Now, do I survive? And the, the puzzle seems to be that uh, it seems to say that double success counts as failure, because if only one hemisphere survived, and we transplanted, we would say, I did survive. Well, presumably you wouldn't, but uh, the views that he was engaging with would say that I do. Because certainly if you asked this person if it is Simon Cushing and he has survived, it would say, yes, it's great. You know, modern technology, thumbs up. Um, uh, whereas, uh, and we would say that's okay. But of course, if both of them survive, then we say, oh, no, then either both of them are or neither of them are or one of them is and each of those uh, each of those views ends up being intolerable so we get this weird uh, problem that single success is success but double success is a failure uh -huh. now david lewis's view says oh no no you can have double success be double success yeah. uh, by saying that actually there were always two people uh -huh. um, it's just that uh, what a person is, is not something that exists three-dimensionally. It's not as if right now, all of me is here right now in this instant. Instead, what I am is a, a four-dimensional time worm, as it were. And if it turns out that I split, well, it turns out that there were two time worms that overlapped for a while, and that this, this thing that exists three-dimensionally right now is a part of both of them. Just as, you know, in a conjoined twins, maybe their torso is a part of both of them. Yeah. So um, that view seems to 
uh, lay open the possibility of division or me being more than one, or there being more than one thing here in a non-objectionable sense. You want to say if there's two people sitting in that chair, the theory yes. must be must be problematic. Whereas this view says, well, no, you don't have to say that. You can say that two people can lay claim or two beings can lay claim to this three-dimensional chunk without there being two people here, as it were. Okay, now, so the what you call four-dimensionalism is the view that persisting things are composed of temporal parts. Right. So, 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 so for any period of your life, there is actually a part of you, a physical flesh and blood object that exists, just like you accept it exists only during that period, right? So there's a being right. just like you that exists only during this, interv this interview, right? So it began when the interv interview began, and it will, it will cease to exist just like that right. uh, uh, when the interview ends and so on, okay? And it's also combined with a sort of... Uh, universal composition. So there is something composed of, let's say, your first half and my second half. Uh, and so, 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 so this view would imply that there actually is uh, such a being as the chair of your department, a flesh and blood being. Right. Uh, that starts, a many-headed beast. Yes, changes from male to female and jumps discontinuously right. many times and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, 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 yes, so, so, so this sort of ontology transforms all debates about the persistence and identity of concrete objects, okay, personal identity, among others. So you, you, you've got all these entities, and for any view that you might have about personal identity, pretty much apart from Cartesian views or something, there will be entities that that satisfy that description. So uh, 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 there is actually uh, a being uh, coinciding with you, composed, sharing your current temporal parts, which will come to an end when you when you stop being a teacher, for example, right? right. <laughs> uh, uh, and and so on. Um, so where am I going with this? Um, is this a way to respond to your two okay. thinkers problem? Yes, yes. So on, 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 on this view, there are, there are all sorts of thinkers sitting here right now, right? Because this uh, current temporal part is a temporal part of, 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 of gazillions of objects with, that diverge in the past and diverge in the future, right? So there's one that will... Uh, that began when I began and coincided with me, but, but but then will jump from me to you right now, let's say. Or you, I mean, you uh, could have a version of this view that didn't want, because I, I think it's kind of open if you uh, believe in temporal parts to say, uh, I, there's a name for this view that allows you to, I think this is Quine's view, or, or, you know, he's one of the famous advocates of it that, you know, there's no sort of natural objects. It's just up to us. You know, there's there's an object that consists of the tip of my nose and the sun uh, five million years ago or something like yeah. that, because why not? Uh, but you could have a view that said, well, no, I want to say that, you know, the world carves itself up a bit. The, you know, it's not entirely our choosing as to def decide on the objects. So let's say there really are people, and how many people there are sitting in this chair is not something I know yet, because it kind of depends if I twin in the future. Yeah. So if I twin in the future, then it will turn out retrospectively that there were two people sitting here. Yeah. But if I don't, well, then there was only one, or it was a what's yes. sitting here is a part of only one. Yes. So 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 there are all sorts of be so so to be a person on on. Lewis's view is not just to be a being with the right mental properties, because there are all sorts of beings like that, with all sorts of weird and gerrymandered histories. Okay, the you know, one that jumps from me to you, for example. Right. It's, 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 it's just, it's got all the mental properties that I've got until it jumps to you, and when it, when it requires all the mental properties that, you, that, that you've got. But it's not a person. Uh, to be a person, you have to not just uh, have the right special mental properties, but you have to be composed of 
what Lewis calls person stages, very sh short-lived temporal parts, that have the, bear the right relation to one another, some sort of psychological continuity or connectedness. And there isn't any psychological continuity or connectedness in that case between you and me. Uh, so, uh, 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 as far as you know. As far as I know, yes, yes. So we just ignore, we ignore most of the thinking intelligent beings. Uh, certain special ones we call people and we give them names, like Simon or Eric. Right. Uh, and so questions about personal identity over time become really linguistic questions. The question is, which of these many uh, gerrymandered four-dimensional objects do we, call, do we call people, and which ones are the reference of our personal pronouns and proper names. Yeah. yeah. So, but still, the, the, I mean, isn't this uh, a way to, to respond to your worry that uh, we can't have two thinking things sitting there? We say, well, no, there's only ever one thing thinking sitting there, the temporal part. Oh, okay. Well, okay, the, 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 the epistemic question still arises. How do I, so, so, so there are millions and billions and trillions of uh, intelligent beings sitting here and thinking, what am I? Uh, which one am I? How could I ever know which one am I? Which one I refer to when I say I? Uh, well, but that, why do you have to? I mean, it's like, uh, for example, uh, I think Lewis gives this analogy. Uh, in Flint, well, he doesn't give this analogy, but I'm, I'm making it more specific. In Flint, uh, the two freeways, the 23 and the 75, come together for a spell, and then they divide again. Uh -huh. So I'm driving along the freeway through, uh, you know, th through parts of Flint, yeah. and I say, am I on the 23 or the 75? Doesn't really matter. I'm on both. But, right. and, and I wouldn't get engaged with, but which is it? Which is it? Is it the 23 or the 75? It's both. Well, that, 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 that's actually an answer to, to, to a different question. If you ask, how many people are there here? Right. I said, well, uh, 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 you, might, you might think, well, there are, or for that matter, if you ask how many conscious intelligent beings are there here, of course, you could say, well, there are millions and billions and trillions. Uh, but you could also say, also, also say there's one, because there, there's, there's only one stage here. So, and, and, and so right. we, we, uh, 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 we, for most ordinary purposes, we count them all as one, just as in that case, you count both roads as one. If you right. ask, how many roads do you have to cross to get from here to there? Right. Yeah, that's uh, you count them as one. So there's only one person here, uh, but in a, in a way there's one, but in another way there are lots and lots of them, lots and lots of intelligent beings. Uh, so that doesn't, and you can still ask, which one am I? Just as you, you might well ask, if you're on that section of road that's uh, the, wh where the two highways coincide, you can ask, where does this road go to? And there might be, you might say, well, it goes here, and it also goes there. Or you might say, one of them goes here, and one of them goes there. Uh, so, and likewise, there's... One of the one of the conscious beings sitting here will go with the right hemisphere. Let's say one of them will go with the left hemisphere. Where am I going to go? That question can still be asked. You might say, in this case, the answer is well, simply that there are two of us. One will go this way, and one will go that way. One will go right. One will go left. Uh, you can't say that generally. You can't say. There are millions and billions and trillions of conscious beings here, and they'll all go different ways. And asking which one of them is me is pointless, because then uh, I won't have any way to plan for the future. I mean, I won't know whether I'll be sitting here uh, in five minutes' time, or whether I'll be sitting in, 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 in Flint in five minutes' time, or whether I'll be <laughs> cease to exist between now and then, or whatever. Because all of those, the, 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 there are conscious beings sitting here uh, to which those things happen. Right, so, 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 so most of these candidates have to get ignored. So the, 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 the four-dimensionalist needs some account of, what, of, of which of these many objects get picked out by our personal pronouns and proper names, and which ones get ignored. 
So yeah. is that what you're, why you reject it? Or are you just saying it has puzzles that you think are worse than? I, 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 I guess what I was trying to say is that the four dimensional, four dimensionalism does not by itself solve, uh, 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 answer all the questions, uh, solve the problem about, uh, 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 the problems that arise about there being more than one thing being here. Okay, it, it, it implies that, 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 that there's more than one, but it doesn't by itself tell you how to deal with that or, or why that isn't as bad as it sounds. You need I, something else. I guess I, I just think it makes, it's a story that makes it less ridiculous sounding that there should be more than one thinking being there. You, are, I mean, it seems like originally, or at least when you present this to uh, an introductory audience, it's like a knockdown here. There, this view says that there are two thinking beings here. Uh, mm -hmm. Four dimensionalists, can't a four dimensionalist say that doesn't trouble me? Yes, but, but, well, four dimensionalism at least gives you a principled explanation of why there are so many beings there. It tells, it tells you how many there are and why there are that number and so on. So it's, it, it's, it, it, uh, it, it, it's a systematic uh, ontology of material objects. Okay. If all you, if, if if all you say is that there are two things here, uh, a person which would go one way and, and an organism that, that would go other way, and then you stop, uh, you haven't given any systematic uh, ontology of material objects, and you've, you've said nothing about why there are those two objects and why we should believe it, and so on. It, it raises all sorts of questions, and it seems rather you know, rather arbitrary and hoped up. Okay. Uh, um what if, what about going back to like twinning cases, mm -hmm. um, like amoeba or something? So uh, yeah, what would you say uh, as an animalist about what happens in uh, the division of an amoeba, where you have after the split, you let's say you have exa exactly the same quantity of biological material, has the original one ceased to exist? I suppose so. That's what the that's what the experts on uh, biological individuation say, anyway. Yes. So. Um, it's better than the alternatives, anyway. So you, in other words, you don't have to say there are two beings here. Um, so uh, would you say then, in cases of human twins, um, in cases where there is no twinning? Let's say there's a kind of, I find it a little bit macabre, but maybe I'm just queasy. Um, when we had our first kid, uh, when they did the ultrasound, they give you a photo of it mm. and they put it in this thing that said, baby's first photo. <laughs> and it's this, it's this image of what looks like the alien because they've caught, yeah. or at least fish bones, because all you can see is, you know, bones outline. Yeah. And, you know, it's like you're supposed to goo-goo over this. But imagine they take this even further. At one stage, they were they were putting, I don't know if this is still the case, they were putting ultrasounds in malls. So you could just go in like a photo booth and get an ultrasound of your baby. Really? Gosh. I know. And, and uh, people were worried. Well, we did, still don't know how what the effects of ultrasounds are. But anyway, imagine um, now they can do this right to the point of conception. So, you know, you go in and, and, you know, the next morning after the conception has occurred and you, you spot the fertilized egg and they put this, it in this little picture, you know, baby's first picture. Um, if there is no twinning, I look back and I say, hey, there's me. Whereas if there is twinning, neither of the twins can say that's me. Is that right? Well, let me say first, this is again a question about animal identity. It's a question that doesn't arise especially for me. Even right. if you weren't an animal, you, 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 you would face the very same question about the biological organism. Uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm not sure why I have to have an answer to this question. Well, it's just that, but, uh, for example, you have that paper that says, uh, was I a fetus? And it seems like you, you make uh, one, of, one of the arguments that works for, yeah. for the average person, let's say, is 
you know, personal identity theorists have to say, I was not a fetus because it wasn't conscious yet, whereas you can say I was a fetus. Yes, yes. And the, yeah, the, the question is probably more pressing for me or more important for me than it is for a, a, a non-animals. Yes. I, 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 I suppose if you want to be realistic, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that I was ever a fertilized egg uh, because it doesn't seem to me that when the egg divides in two and then into four and so on, that you get a multicellular, a multicellular organism. Uh, I mean, think of it this way: when the cell, when 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 the fertilized egg splits in two, that cell ceases to exist, presumably. Uh huh. Just like the amoeba does. Okay, but uh, if the organism continues to exist, then you had two things in the same place at once: the organism and the cell. The organism must okay. be something different from the cell. Right, because the organism could uh, su survive the division and the cell didn't. And I don't want to say that. Uh, as far as I know, and I'm not very confident about this, but the, 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 this is what the, a, 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 a lot of people who, are, who know more about this than I do think, uh, that you don't get a multicellular organism until something like 14 or 16 days after fertilization when the cells begin to specialize, when they start acting as a unit rather than just being sort of stuck together. Uh, and at that point, twinning can no longer take place in the natural course of events anyway. Uh, and of course, it, it, it may still be possible to do some sort of surgery on this uh, microscopic organism and get two living embryos out of it. Okay. And in that case, what you said, I suppose, would still apply. You could then... If they were, if, if the surgery hadn't taken place, the person could later say, "Yes, that was, that's me, my first picture." Uh, if, in the case where the surgery took place, neither of the resulting people could uh, uh, could say that that was, that that was that that was that was them. That's true, but is that is that a problem? Well, I, it's I don't see how to avoid that. Now, what, what I'm trying to get at is it um, maybe I'm uh, pushing up against sort of a cartoonish version of your view. Um, but I think I've always found the uh, uh, cards on the table. I have found, you know, the, the view that you rejected wholeheartedly. Um, well, there are puzzles involved. It seems to me that that's, uh, I guess, who says this now? What matters? Who, who's, who likes that phrase? It's Parfit, you mean. What's that? Parfit, you mean. For... Uh, specifically about what, what matters in continuation. And I don't care if it could be the case that you could download me into the Matrix and I had a choice on my deathbed, I'd probably take it, and I'd probably think, hey, this is a good thing. Mm. Um, and I've got a chance of surviving, maybe. Whereas, do you think... Do you think that, were you in that situation, it, it you might do it, but just as sort of a, an interesting thing that there would be something to remember you by, sort of as if there were an animatronic version of you that existed in the future, but you would say, oh, there's no question I'm a Ghana because this organism is on its last legs. Okay, so, 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 so just, just to get straight, this, the, what they're offering is that they will somehow read off the information from my brain and use it to create a person in the computer, in the matrix, excuse me, who will then have a good life? Is that or, or we could have another version where we could say, you know, my body is getting eaten away by cancer, and slowly they could replace. Uh, I know, I know you you have invaded against fanciful thought experiments. So I'm sorry, but I, um, uh, you know, this seems actually more plausible, perhaps, that uh, they invent little artificial cells, and each of the ones that gets eaten away by cancer, they replace it with an artificial one. Now you've actually said that, therefore. I, the animal is shrinking every time this happens because an animal is not uh, a human-made synthetic thing. But suppose uh, they gradually replace my cells one by one with these synthetic things until eventually 
there is none, no biological entity left, but there's this thing that looks like me uh, if you don't look at it. If you look at it under a microscope, you can see the little trademark engraved on it in, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. right, uh, at a molecular level. But um, this thing thinks it's me, uh, but it's certainly not the, it's not an animal. Um, it has a good launch. Sure, it's certainly, if you ask it, well, as good a life as I'm having now, and, yeah. uh, and let's hope better. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, or maybe, you know, it would say, I don't think, you know, don't give me your life talk anymore. I have, I have progressed beyond that. Um, I am now, you know, an, uh, an artificial being that doesn't need, uh, d doesn't need to talk in terms of life or, or whatever. But, but at any rate, it's an entirely artificial being that thinks it's me. Would you say uh, there's no value in that? Or would you say, well, there's something that exists, but it's certainly not Simon Cushing. It's just a simulacrum that is deluded in thinking that it's Simon Cushing or, or what? Uh, uh, well, I would say that it's not Simon and that it's mistaken to think that it is. You hurt its feelings. Uh, but... Well, I don't know whether it, maybe it's uh, if I hurt its feelings, it's 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 well, maybe I've, maybe I've been a bit indelicate, or or, or 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 maybe it's too quick to take offence because uh, it might well be that having a even though it's it's not going to be you, but having a, a sort of successor like that who will. Uh, carry out your projects and look after your family and and defend your political and, and, and philosophical views and finish writing your books and, 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 and carry on this interview series and so on and so forth might well, well mean a lot to you. It can be very important. Uh, it's not such it, it, it's not a trivial thing at all. It, it, it might have a lot of what matters practically and you could possibly even argue that uh, this being would be morally responsible for your actions and would be entitled to your bank account, uh, your, you know, your, your publication record, uh, and so on. I don't know. It wouldn't be. I hope it does a better job with it than I but, have. But, 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 but maybe you would have a great deal of what is important. Uh, of, of, of what you want and wanting to continue existing, wanting to stay alive. I don't want to rule that out. So it could besmirch my reputation, for example. Suppose it then went off and committed horrible murders. Well, uh, the view of Simon Cushing in the history book should be a negative one. He started out so well, but then he went bad. Uh, Yes, well, that, 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 there are always risks like that, yes. <laughs> uh, but I think this is another case where the metaphysics does not by itself dictate uh, the claims about value. Isn't that what most people who have written on this topic care about, though? Would you say they're wrong to care about that? Or it's fine to care about that, but, but there's this other topic that is perhaps to you much more interesting and you it's, think should be to them as well? It's fine to care about value, but I think it's a mistake to try and, to try and twist the metaphysic, to tw twist the metaphysics to, to make it coincide with the, with, with the claims about value in a, in, 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 in a neat and simple way, uh, because it's, it's never going to be very neat and simple in, in any way, and, and there's no reason why. Uh, it seems to me... Well, it, it, it seems a mistake to start with uh, a, a plausible claim about value and then have that lead you to a silly view, uh, view of metaphysics. I'd much rather have a, have a sensible metaphysical view and a sensible view about value and, and then see what I can do to make those compatible. And I'm, I'm not convinced that there isn't any way of making them compatible. And there's quite, quite a lot of work has been done by Parfit and others about, uh, 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 based on the assumption that they don't always go together. That isn't too abstract. I'm, ju I'm just thinking, though, um, suppose you're selling an undergraduate on why they should have your view, um, and they say, well, will this view mean that I should no longer, I shouldn't care, 
suppose you, uh, you know this is in the future where such simulacra are possible and suppose the undergraduate is faced with a decision again a totally arbitrary uh, fanciful thought experiment um, where they only have the funds to keep themselves uh, keep as a, a version of themselves with a dead cortex alive in perpetuity or uh, they can do that or they can uh, pay for this artificial version you know where their cells have gradually replaced mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like they say well your animalism has convinced me so I know that I should go for the former what you would say is oh no 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 don't don't uh, make decisions like that on the basis of metaphysics uh, it's entirely up to you which you choose I'm just saying that in one case you survive and in another case you don't. But uh, my view doesn't say which one it should be more important to you. Yes. Yes, precisely. Yes. If you want to know what you want to do, then you need to think about value. So it seems like a lot of people would say this question, what are we, is interesting precisely because it seems like it will settle the issue of what we should care about. Whereas you're saying, no, it's independently interesting and it won't settle those issues. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it, it might put constraints on questions about value. It might have implications about value, but it's certainly not going to settle all the, to settle all the value questions. I, I, I don't know of any metaphysical question. I, 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 I don't know of any metaphysical project which will by itself settle all the big questions about value. I mean, even if we could show that God exists, that would certainly have very important implications about what we ought to do and how we ought to live, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't settle the question. It would. St it would still leave a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be done. So meta ethics shouldn't affect ethics. That sounds right. Yes, I suppose. I, I mean, it, that's it, a relief because well, I was never well, any good at meta ethics. Not that it shouldn't affect it, but that it shouldn't dictate anyway. I mean, it, it, it might have, it have implications for ethics, maybe important ones, but it's not going to, it, 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 it leaves you with a lot of work to be done. It's not going to, to, to take the place of ethics. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems right to me in that you will occasionally get, this has happened to me, um, that you will get undergraduates who say, well, there's no argument that can show there are such things as rights. In fact, there's all kinds of arguments that show that they would be, that they're very ontologically or metaphysically suspect. So therefore, who cares about rights? You know, we don't, we shouldn't, there are no such things, so I can't violate them, so I'll do what I damn well please. Or, mm -hmm. or you know, they take arguments that show that there is no such thing as race. Uh, it is certainly not a category that uh, is biological or anything like that. So therefore, there's no such thing as racism. There's another case of corrupting the youth with philosophy, I suppose. <laughs> Dangerous thing. See, it was yeah. maybe it was maybe we should side with Socrates' accusers after all. Um, okay. Do you think you're more or less done with personal identity, at least for now? Maybe you'll revisit it and you want to move on to things like time? Or is this your project for the long haul? Well, that's a hard question. I have been trying to get away from it and do other things. I mean, I've been thinking about death, for example. In <laughs> as one does, as one gets older. Yes, well, mostly about things I'm connected to uh, metaphysics, though not, not entirely. Um, uh, I have occasionally, I, I'm still doing a bit of work on personal identity. I mean, I recently published an article about what exactly it means to say that we're animals and how this, how this claim is often misunderstood. I've just been, uh, uh, I've, I've just had a, a, a visitor who's working on narrativist theories of personal identity. and. So I, I got a bit interested in that just from talking with him. So I might be, I might, might write a paper about that. But oh, you should watch my interview with Maria Schechtman then. Oh, oh gosh, yes, yes, it, it's 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 it, it's 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 that sort of thing. But I'm I'm not really very interested in that because it's it's I don't find it very clear, actually. But it, I mean, it, it's it. I think I've said most of what I want to say uh, about personal identity, and I'm. I, 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 I'd like to move on to something else, but this 
it's I don't know. I'm not sure whether, whether, whether this is a biographical question or whether it's a philosophical question. Whether you're asking, well, it's both. Is there more work to be done? Right. Uh, there is more work to be done, though. I think. Have the camps become a little too entrenched? I mean, that can happen after a while. I always find that when uh, you get into a topic, it's very, it's great at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then camps get established, and it becomes. Like one of those fractal pictures where you you look the more you keep looking closer and closer and there's and there's always more and more detail and at some point it's um, well now the arguments are so uh, tiny and detailed that we've lost the big picture. I don't think it's quite got to that point yet, though. That that, that is always a danger. I think I don't know. I mean, there are. Some, there are, I think, important views that, uh, like, for example, this constitution view, that are not not fully understood. I think these views are still a bit mysterious in a number of ways. And there might also be other views about what we are that I haven't thought of and which haven't been discussed at all. Uh, so I think there is still more work to be done, though I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm the best person to do it. And I do sort of sort of want to move on to something else. They keep they just you. when you thought you were out, they drag you back in. Uh. Um, so, let's see. Oh, yes. Do you think that philosophy has a public role? I mean, philosophy, I, I think, is a little bit under threat. Uh, there are uh. places where philosophy departments have been closed. Yeah. Um, do you think that this is a mistake? Do you think that philosophy is its, has become its own worst enemy and that there's a better way to do philosophy that is more engaged? Or do you think that uh, the world should move to us and, and discover what is wonderful about philosophy? Hmm. Well, I suppose if there's one thing that philosophers are indisputably good at, at least if the good philosophers anyway, it's, it's asking awkward questions and getting very clear about things and drawing out the implications of various claims and, and, and things like that. Uh, and I think philosophers are uniquely, are, 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 tend to be better at this than people in other disciplines because that's that's our bread and butter. That, that's how philosophy works, by, by making subtle distinctions and being very clear and careful uh, and, 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 and looking at other alternatives and, 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 and questioning uh, 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 not just accepting the what's come down to us, but but by being a bit irreverent and and and, and questioning basic presuppositions. So I, I, it would be terrible, I think, if 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 this sort of thing were lost. That's. Do you, do you think there's an age that it should start? For example, uh, one of the reasons I ended up in philosophy. Uh, was partly because I'd never done it in in my schooling up to that point. There's a degree called politics, philosophy, and economics, and I applied to do that degree. As an, it's funny, we've swapped places, or, or you've you've ended up in England from America, and I ended up in America from England. But I was an undergraduate in England, and I applied to do that degree because I figured, hey, they can't expect me to know anything uh, when I arrive, and I found that refreshing. Uh -huh. um, do you think that philosophy should start younger? Do you think it can be taught to kids? Uh, for example, when I visit England, I see that there are there's a much larger variety of sort of pop psycho uh, pop philosophy books in English bookshops, like Stephen Law's books, which I think are really good. Uh, uh -huh. If you've seen those, the philosophy files he called them originally when the X Files were popular, but but they're they're pitched at sort of twelve year olds or something like that. Right. Or do you think that uh, that too much philosophy too early can corrupt you or perhaps disable you? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know, actually, because I've, I've never tried to teach philosophy to 12-year-olds and I, I've never seen it done. So it, it's it's a sort of experiment, I guess. And maybe maybe there's not much point in, in, in speculating about it. So, I, I, yeah, I don't know what the effect is of teaching philosophy to, 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 to 12-year-olds. There's some philosophy that I think it's pointless to attempt 
uh, for example, political philosophy, because uh, nobody has any intuitions. I think it's only when you've actually started to think about the world. You can still ask 12-year-olds, why are we obliged to obey the laws, for example, which we didn't, which we didn't, we didn't, we we weren't consulted on, and so on. That, I, mean, I mean, that's a good, a, a, a good sort of introductory question in, 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 in political philosophy. At which point they point to the Brexit vote and they say, that's why. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think it would be good if more people learned a bit of philosophy. I mean, you only have to look at what uh, celebrity scientists say. Uh, they make all sorts of elementary philosophical blunders when you give them a microphone. If, 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 if they had learned just even a little bit of philosophy, they would be more careful. For God's sake, somebody shut Richard Dawkins up. Mm. Um, no, I, I agree with some of what he says. Mm. But the, um, yeah, actually, I, I found that uh, when, I, when you read scientific studies, um, it's amazingly how quickly they depart from the science. So if you actually read the scientific yes. studies, it's okay. It's very careful, very small. But then there's sort of various levels of reporting on it. There's the scientific journal, and they say, oh, this means that mm. autism is lack of mirror, cell, uh, mirror neurons or homosexual, there is a gay gene or something like that. And it's, wait, wait, wait a minute, you know. And it's not clear that, uh, because well, there is presumably a reason why they did this study, and they're hoping that it will, will do this. But uh, usually the reason they did the study in the first place is pretty suspect. Uh, and then you, you know, the minute you start drawing conclusions from it, you're off the bandwagon. Mm. Yes, y- yes. As soon as you start interpreting, the, sorry, interpreting the experimental data, or, 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 or trying to say what these, you know, what these mathematical models actually mean in real life, you're, in a way, you're doing philosophy, I suppose, or at least, yeah, you, you need to be very careful, and it, it, it's, it, it's easy to. Uh, to get carried away by some very colorful interpretation of this stuff, uh, and 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 because scientists have are held in such high esteem, people tend to take them at their word and they don't question them. And we philosophers know better. <laughs> and if more people had 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 been taught philosophy, they might know better as well. But as you say, I mean, I think you put it nicely in this. Uh, in your piece in this uh, set of interviews, it would be good. Both sides benefit from the other. You know, more physicists should do philosophy and more philosophers should do uh, the hard sciences. Absolutely, yes. I think uh, particularly in metaphysics, it, it's, yes, metaphysicians are, 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 are often hampered by lack of knowledge of basic physics, for example.